So again, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Kingdom Conversation where we are addressing building strong families. Uh, we believe that the family is an institution that God himself initiated for his own glory, and we get to be beneficiaries of all the goodness and the great things that happen in the families. And so for all of those that's joining us online, we welcome you as well. And I just want to encourage you, if you have any questions, send them in, and we will address them at the appropriate time during the course of this message. So now, <clears throat> we are dealing this morning with what is generally called single parenting. But I'm going to change that name as the message goes along. But I have to give it to you as you know it. So you can follow me as I develop the message. Amen? Last week, we spoke on singles and wholeness. And I want to encourage every parent and every single person to make sure you listen to that message again. Because it's not just for our singles, it's also for our parents to help guide our singles when that time comes for them to have to make a decision. And I want to say to you that if we don't make that right choice as a single person, there is a great possibility that we find ourselves in this next category. And for those of us that are in a struggling marriage relationship now, I also want to encourage you, you do everything you can to fix the struggle so that you can eliminate that struggle and you can have a fulfilled and satisfying marriage because if you don't, what we are talking today will apply to you. And for those of us, who find ourselves as parents and as single, which is the subject of our discussion this morning, I want to strongly encourage you that even though you've gone through some very tough and challenging times, and even though there have been struggles, and you may still, in fact, be in struggle as we speak, you need to know that God has your back. People are parenting and single for various reasons. It's possible that people have children out of wedlock, or perhaps the significant other, the spouse, has passed away, or perhaps through a divorce. It does not matter how you find yourself in this situation. Whatever the reason is, the need or the needs are the same. And the solution is also the same. Now, uh, let, let me first go to Exodus 22. I know I said Genesis 21. Exodus 22, verse 22. Let me just give us a few scriptures to show the heart of God towards homes where we have parents who are single. In Exodus 22, verse 22, the Bible says, You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Give me the next one. I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 10. I'll give you guys a, little, a list of scriptures. Thank you. This is God. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Next one, please. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Psalm 68 verse 5. God is a, God of, is a father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. Psalms 146 verse 9. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. Now, I wanted to give you those scriptures. And this do not even do justice to all the scriptures where God deals or addresses or talks to the fatherless and widows. And perhaps the reason the Bible does not mention the, the, the word parents that are single or single parenting is because in that time, 
we did not have that category per se. People did not become parents who were single because of divorce. But in that time, there were many instances, and we're going to see a few of them in the scriptures as we go along, many people were fatherless because the father in the home had passed away. Okay? So the issue here, what I want you to take away from here, from this scripture, is that God is acutely concerned for any home, any situation where you have a home where there is no father. And if God could speak to us today, he will even add one more category. He would say that he's just as concerned for a home where a father is a single parent and there's no mother. Because that's what we have today. Now, getting to the message, I just want to give us some statistics. I want to show us where we are. Let's go to the statistics, please. Thank you. In the United States, 61% are two-parent households. 39% are now what we call parents that are single. That's more than one out of three. So in a, at any given time in our churches, you can readily assume that 30% or more of our congregation are facing this challenge. Amen? 38.5% of all births in the U.S. are to unmarried women, and should we say to unmarried men as well. Of single parents between 1994 and 2006, 84% are single parent moms. That figure is from 3 million in 1994 and by 2006 is 10.4 million. 16% as of single parents are dads. Wait, 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 wait. Don't run. <laughs> okay? So look at the look at the look at the increase. In 1994, we had 393,000 men who were single parent dads. As of 2006, it's risen to 2.5 million. Now, next slide, thank you. 75% of all children in the US will spend at least some time in a single parent household. Each year, the percentage of single parent households continue to grow. Statistics marrying again. 38% of all weddings in the U.S. are remarriages for one or both partners. Most form step families. 33% of individuals who got divorced in 2008, just one year, just one year, this study, one year, were re-divorcing. That is, they were divorcing again. Did you get that? Go back a minute. Go back, go back a minute. 33%, more than one third, of those who were divorced in 2008 were already re-divorcing again. Okay? All right, now. Move on. 33% of all stepfamily marriages last until death do we part. Now, we want to see that figure go up. Last one. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. I hope you guys are praying for me. Over 60% of remarriages and in divorce. And that's why I said to you guys who are struggling right now in your married relationship, you need to fix it. We need to trust God to fix whatever is wrong. God can do it. He can fix it. So we don't become part of the statistics. Okay, over 60% of remarriages end in divorce, subjecting children to yet 
another family failure. 73% of third marriages any divorce. Now, time parents are with their children. In 1950, parents spent 54% of time with their children. Today, parents are busier than the children. Parents are more busy on Facebook and Instagram than children. And they only spend 18%. Now, I wanted to show you this statistic so we all are aware of the daunting challenge that's facing us. However, I don't want us to be overtaken by the statistics because God has a plan, God has a way, and God will give us the victory on every end if we comply and follow his guidance in Jesus' name. Having said that, now let's go back to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21, beginning from verse 9. This story is the very first example mentioned in all of scriptures where it relates to a parent that is single. It's the story of Hagar. Genesis 21 verse 9, and Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. Now, maybe I should give you the background here. Does everybody know Hagar? Okay. Therefore, she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be here with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Yet, I will, also make, I will also make a nation of the son of the bond woman because it's your seed. Verse 14. So Abraham rose in the morning, took bread and a skin of water and put it in on her shoulder. He gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Go on, please. And the water in his skin was used up and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went out and sat, uh, sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of this boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. Go on. And God heard the voice of the Lord. Then the angel of God called, called to Hagar and out of heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Go ahead. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. And to every parent that is here this morning and that is single, I can offer you the same assurance that God offered Hagar in saying to you, even though you are concerned about your children, you are concerned about the absence of a father or a mother in the home, you are concerned about their welfare, you are concerned about how are we going to make it, how are we going to pay the next rent, tuition fees, school supplies, all the things that go with parenting, how will I cope from practice to choir, to school, and so forth and so on. And the questions go on and on and on. They are, they are endless. God said one thing to Hagar. He said, Hagar, I will make of him a great nation. And so I want to say to you this morning, no matter how hard the struggle is, 
you can take God's word to the bank. And you can cash on it because God will not become a liar. It's amazing that when Hagar left, when we read this passage, the Bible says she went to the wilderness of Beersheba. That is important to know that. Beersheba means a place of oath. <laughs> This woman was bewildered. She became a single parent to no fault of hers. First of all, to begin with, she did not acquiesce to the relationship that God had to where she was. This relationship was forced upon her, found herself in a situation that she did not bargain for, minding her own business, and then at the end of the day, her mistress, Sarah said, you know what? It's time for you to check out. Abraham didn't like it. But God came and confirmed what Sarah said. And at the end of the day, put a skin of water, like a, like a bottle of water. Gave the boy to her and said, that's it. Go. So I can just imagine for all the parents that are single, maybe the day you found out you were pregnant. Or the day the man or the woman came home and said, I'm leaving. Or the day you found out that your spouse is dead or is gone. I can only imagine the trauma of having to cope with this news. Because when that happens, you feel like your world is totally, completely upside down. That the rug is being pulled from off your feet. And you're wondering, how will I ever make it? I want to say to you this morning. Without a shadow of doubt. In fact, I can, I can tell you, my wife, will tell, my wife will be a witness. I have never been as burdened as I was preparing for this message. She will, she will tell you. Last night she was asking me, are, are you sleeping? I lay down in the bed, but I couldn't sleep. No, no, not, because, not because I didn't want to sleep, but I just recognized the burden. I, 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 I took on the burden of the responsibility of understanding what this category of wonderful, blessed Christians may be going through. It's unbelievable. So let me use Hagar's name as an acronym to help us get an overview of this concept of being a parent that is single. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hagar's name is spelled H-A-G-A-R. Let me just quickly take those five letters and provide an overview. And then we're going to come back and deal with some practical things. And then we're going to thereafter bring a couple of parents on a podium and have a conversation. Is that all right with you guys? Hagar, that first letter means, or rather, that first letter is H. And for that H, let me throw out the word hope. Hope. No matter where you find yourself this morning, no matter the hell that you think you've been through, I want you to know that God offers you hope. Hey. Hey. Bible says in Hebrews 11, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hope defines an anticipation of a future that is good. And yes, I know there may be hardship, there may be questions unanswered, there may be situations that you find yourself in. I'm saying to you this morning, even this shall pass. Yeah. 
how can we have hope? Why? How, how, you say, you, you, somebody may be saying, Pastor, it's, yeah, it's all right for you to say that. You are married, you have a home, you have a wife, you have a children. And yes, it, it's one thing for you to say that. It's for, one thing for you to be in what I am. I hear you. So how? How can you have hope? You can have hope because what, God's word does not fail. If you listen to the passage we just read in Genesis 21, Give it back to me. Thank you. Go back up, maybe two verses up. Okay, give me verse 17. Good. Watch this. And God heard the cry or the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? What? Why? Now, by the way, that angel there is not just an angel. This is Jesus. I don't have time to unpack that to show you that. Because notice this angel is not speaking in third person. He's speaking directly. You can see that when you read verses 18 and 19 where it says, I will make him a great nation. An angel cannot make anybody anything except God does it. Do you hear that? I don't have time to go back and unpack everything for you, but just take it for, just take my word for it. Go and research in the scriptures, you see it to be so. But the point I'm making is this. Why did the angel say, what ails you? This woman is crying. The son is crying. And you are asking me what's ailing me? What kind of a question is that? You see somebody in pain, somebody else hurting, and you are saying, hey, what's wrong with you? But you see, there's a reason for which that angel could say that. Because in a few chapters previously, Genesis chapter 16, give that to me. Beginning from verse, is it verse 7? Genesis chapter 16. Begin from verse 7. That's an angel. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. What's happened here? Hagar was upset one day at home and left. She was under oppression in Abraham's life and left. And as she left, the same angel came. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. By the spring on the way to shore. Go on. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from? And where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Go ahead. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Go ahead. Watch this. How and why can you have hope? Verse 10. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply. Now, you see that this cannot be an ordinary angel. Angels don't multiply anybody. Angels are servants. This is God speaking. Jesus is the one that's making this appearance. I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. Even when it looked like nothing is happening, when it looked like you cannot put food on the table, when it looked like you cannot put clothes on your back, when it looked like you will not survive, God wants you to have hope. I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. Oh, hallelujah! That's why you can have hope. You can have hope because Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans of peace and not of evil to bring you to an expected end. The pastor, I don't see it yet. Okay, maybe you don't see it now, but keep on living. Because weeping may endure for a moment, but joy is coming in the morning. Romans 8, 
28 says, all things work together for good. You say, how can any good thing come out of my situation? I have no husband. I have no wife. I have kids to feed. I have kids to clothe. I have kids to cover. How can any good thing possibly come out of this? Keep on living. Because Romans 8.38 says, you who look feeble and weak right now, the Bible says, you are more than a conqueror. Because right now, you see yourself as a victim. But God said, no, 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 no. You are not a victim. You are a conqueror. Through him that loves you. Yeah. Hallelujah. And of course, Matthew 28 verse 20 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The man may have left. The woman may have left. But God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when you think you are lonely, when you think you are alone, when you think no one is listening, you see, Hagar did not know anybody was listening when she was crying. She was in the wilderness by herself. And she had no idea that crying would get the attention of a holy God, a caring God, a God that roots for the underdog. Are you hearing me? So the H stands for the hope. Because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, the hopes makes not ashamed because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. A in Haggard's name stands for assistant. Assistant. This is where being a part of a community becomes significantly important. Assistant. Now, give me James chapter 1, verse 27. James 1, 27. Look at what it says. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I'm going to address this more fully when I get into the practicals, practical areas of this uh, teaching. But suffice it to say, that A in Hagar means, as, or rather we can say it means assistance. The ability for the body of Christ to come together and say, you know what? We have this group of people within our midst that God loves so dearly. And therefore, we must be proactive in thinking ahead and seeing where and what areas of need they have. Now, let me say this about this house. And I'm so grateful. Because in preparing for this uh, teaching, I talked to several of the parents that are single. And it blessed me to no end. It blessed me to no end that a few of us have been awakened to the various areas in which we can participate and be a blessing to those who are parents and single. They told me, they said, this past Christmas, I would have loved to mention this person's name. I'm dying to mention their name, but I'm constrained from mentioning their name. So I hope you are praying for me. But they said the man came and brought gifts for all three kids in that particular family. Folks, this is our collective responsibility. We are a body. The first message we did about Jesus being the bread of life talks about how as the bread of life, we take collective responsibility for making sure everybody's need is met. Another one said to me, he said, well, you know, uh, my, my home, we have issues with our computer. This guy came in there, brought the tools in, and fixed the computers. And then, Another one said there was a time when the kids were just too much to handle. And that this guy came in there, just put the kids in the car, and just drove them around the neighborhood for a couple of hours. Now, let me challenge our women, as I'm speaking. 
Because the name of each one that was mentioned to me in this situation were only men. Number one, we didn't have enough men doing it. But number two, none of our women did jack. God help you in Jesus' name. I have more vocabulary I could have spoken, but I'm under the restraint of the Holy Spirit. How can we, with the maternal instinct, miss the fact that others are among us raising two, three, four, five children alone? And we did not take a pause to say, can I take food? Can I take clothing? Can I babysit? What can I do to reach out to just say, I'm here. I'm a sounding board. What can I do for you? This is not the way the body of Christ should function. Let him that has ears to hear. On a good note, on a good note, just this past Sunday, a couple walked up to me. I said that God is dealing with them. That they should initiate, or shall I use the word reinitiate, the benevolent ministry in the house. To, to the effect that the needs of those in the house are met. And I said, they are going to reinitiate this funding. I use the word reinitiate because we used to have it. And then things happened, and then we got away from it. And I'm grateful to God that it's not coming from me. It's coming from a member of the body. Husband and wife, they came up to me. And I said, they're going to put their mouth, their money where their mouth is. And that this Sunday, they are putting $2,500 to reinitiate that fund for benevolence. You are going to do a lot more than clapping. Watch. Wait, 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 wait. Because when I'm a single father or a single mother and I need to clothe my children or buy school supplies, clapping will not do it. So I'm challenging us. If God can speak to one couple to put down $2,500 to reinitiate this, why can we not join with them and partner with them and say, you know what, we're going to put 50, 100, whatever, and let's initiate this fund and let's get this thing going. Is that too much to ask for? My goodness. I'm going to ask that question one more time. The way you guys answered me, I, wish, I hope you don't have stones to throw stones at me. Is it too much to ask for us as a body to help our brothers and our sisters who may be in distress for a season? No. So let's do it. So when they told me that last Sunday, I called the EC, Executive Council, Brother Dario, and I said to him, I said, listen, this is what's going on. Put this structure in place so that we can have this fund running, up and running, so that we can minister to the needs of people in the body. And the EC met this morning. They put together the criteria which they will tell us later on. I can't get into all of that now. But I'm saying to you now that we're going to be more proactive in being our brother's keepers. Amen. Amen? We need to do so. So H stands for hope. A stands for assistance. G, oh yes. It stands for God. Focusing on God in and through whatever is happening in the home. Because in Hagar's situation, Genesis chapter 21, we see that she cried out. She cried. So for me and you, for those of us that are in this situation, the crying is not just crying and say, well, I'm going down the table. No, go, what's going to happen? No, that's not the cry we're talking about. The cry we're talking about is being God-focused. Being God-focused, understanding that you are a man and a woman of hope, understanding that God has plans for you, and crying out to say, God, open my eyes. If you read Genesis 21, oh, is it Genesis 16? I'm not sure which one. Of them. When she cried, yeah, Genesis 21, God opened her eyes to see the provision that was there. <laughs> 
The cry now is to allow God to deal with you so you can see what is already provided. There's provision all around us. But sometimes pain and distress blinds us from seeing what God has already provided. And that's where the God factor comes into place. So H for hope, A for assistance, G for God, A for acceptance. Acceptance. Every one of the parents that are single that I spoke to, particularly the woman, said to me that one of the biggest issues they have to struggle with is the issue of acceptance. Number one, they know what they are dealing with. How they found the same, of course, uh, the, the world, sin, and the, and the world has already put heaps of guilt upon them. Uh, maybe you're not beautiful, beautiful enough. You are not a good mother. There are all kinds of things that are not true. That the enemy has already placed on them to say, that's why you are in this condition. Watch this. They now come to the house of God where the language of the kingdom is love. And they now get cold shoulders from believers. Every last one of them told me that. Even in this house, they said most of our, I'm sorry, let me just give it to you the way they gave it to me. And when they come on the platform, maybe they will reinforce it. I don't know. But they said to me that most women that are married have an arms, or show an arms stretch. Say, don't come near here. Don't come and take my husband. They said they may not vocalize it, but their body language, their tonation, Screaming, stay away from here. So the issue of acceptance. How in the house of God, for cry out loud, can a child of God come into the house of God and have to struggle to be accepted when Jesus said we are all accepted and beloved? loved? So we have a responsibility before God to become sensitive to the needs of those around us and to allow God to use us as instruments to bring relief, to bring encouragement, to bring support and to help in whichever way we can help. I can just imagine Hagar, the next house he went to back in that day, I'm sure they're going to say, ah, you are the one that who's, uh, who was, oh, you got your master's, uh, oh, you got pregnant for you, oh, no, don't come now here. The church today should not be like that. Fear should not dominate us. Love should motivate us. We are not human beings dominated by fear, but we are Christian beings motivated by love. Acceptance. We were worse in the conditions God found us than many people who may be single and parenting. And yet God accepted us unconditionally. Unconditionally. Acceptance. How can we demonstrate that? Holiday times. In fact, that's too far away. That's too far away. How about on a Sunday afternoon, you invite them to lunch in your home? Hello? How about you take them out to lunch? Give them a break so they don't have to go home and, and cook. How about doing something with them and their children to help them understand we are one, part of one another? Hallelujah. H for hope, A for uh, assistance, G for God, A for acceptance, 
an hour for relief. 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 Every stress needs a relief valve. Every stressful condition needs a relief valve. Take time off, chill, do something, just decompress from that stressful situation. And parents that are single are no exception. Amen? Amen. So now, I've just provided you a, a general outline for parents that are single. I'm going to address two specific things, and then I'm going to call uh, a couple of guests to the platform with me, and then we're going to have a conversation. First thing I want to address is the issue of identity. Identity. Give me Luke chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. The issue of identity. When a person goes through the trauma of a status change and find them, themselves in the situation where they are a parent and single. Oh my goodness, the enemy, I can only imagine what the enemy is saying to them about their self-esteem. Self and in the church, we have not helped too much. That's why I said at the beginning, I don't want to call this any longer single, single parenting. Because that label by itself sends a message that is not nearly as positive. Luke 425. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. When heaven was shut up, three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Identity. Avoiding labels. What's the point I'm making? Jesus was referring to the ministry of Elijah in Israel, to widows. But when he spoke about it, here in Luke 4, 26, he said, Elijah was sent to a woman who was a widow. The term woman describes the who you are. The widow describes the what, the condition that you are in. So Jesus did not focus on the condition Rather, it focus on the identity, the who you are. And if you notice in Genesis chapter 16 and Genesis chapter 21, the story of Hagar, when God ministered or spoke with her, God called her by what? By her name. Hagar, what ails you? You are a human being. You have an identity. Don't accept anything less than who you are. So the first thing we need to correct Anybody of Christ is a labeling. We must recognize that parents that are single are first of all, are first and foremost, parents. They are parents, period, end of story. They just happen in this particular season of their life to be single. So rather than separate them into activities that we will call, even though we, we're trying to help them by saying that, but the, what I'm saying to us is that help is counterproductive. We need to receive them as part of the parent good in the body, not just single parenting. Are you hearing me? Second thing I want, I want to deal with is the issue of dual parenting. Man, I don't know about you guys, man, I'm hot in this room. Is it hot? I'm praying for all of you. Go. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, I'm closer to the, okay, I'm closer to heaven. Actually, 
before I get into dual parenting, let, let, me, let me do one more thing, which is, which is very, very critical. Let's address the issue of balancing the checkbook. Because in a situation where there are two parents in a home, and all of a sudden the two parents became one, the first thing that happens, that deposit into the checkbook every week or every month, instead of a dual deposit, now it becomes one deposit. And the needs usually are still the same. Only one income, but you still have to feed the same amount of mouth. School fees must be paid. School supplies must be bought. Clothes, rent, mortgage, utility bills, all of those things continue. So how does a parent at the single face these challenges? <laughs> Number one, we need to be God-focused. A household where there's one parent, we must understand that God truly indeed, from what we just read in the scriptures at the beginning, Exodus 22 verse 22, Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 18, Psalm 16 verse 5, we must understand through all of those scriptures that God is absolutely, completely faithful. And we see this in 1 Kings chapter 17, in verses 9 through 24. Very, 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 very telling to the nature and the character of God that when there was a famine in Israel for three and a half years, which means the famine will have affected the entire population for three and a half years. And God sent his prophet to only one house. The house of a widow. The house of a woman where the husband was no longer there. To show you the demonstration of God's heart when he said, take care of the fatherless and the widows. Elijah was sent to the house of the woman as Zarephath, who was a widow, to supernaturally take care of her needs. Now, is that the only way God takes care of these needs? Balancing the checkbook? No. No. Go with me to Acts chapter 6. You guys should not put this up there. I changed the title already. Why are you putting that up there now? Are you guys hearing anything I've been saying all day? If anything, you should have changed the title for me and, and put the revised title up there. Thank you very much. God bless you. <laughs> I'm not going back under the law. Acts chapter 6. <laughs> Thank you. So I said that God supernaturally meets the needs. We saw that in 1 Kings 17, but that's not the only way he does it. In Acts 6 verse 1, now in, this, in those days, when the number of the disciples was, was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So other than God sending a raven, or doing a supernatural supply, there is a role and a place for the local church to respond, to anticipate, to understand. So in the book of Acts, in the early church, we saw this happen. And as a result of the needs of widows in the early church, an appointment was made to make sure that that need was mitigated. Amen? This is part of God's plan to make sure that this category of people have their needs met. One, God can meet it supernatural. Number two, the church needs to be proactive and responsible. And that's what we're doing with benevolence. Amen? And then number three, we saw in James chapter 1, verse 27, the real pure religion. Pure religion is taking care of the fathers and the widows. 
That's what real, pure religion is all about. Now, what practical ways as a body, as a person, can we help to minister to these needs? In a local church environment, it can take many forms or many shapes. Number one, how about occasional car maintenance? Pick up the car on a Saturday, take it for tune-up and bring it back home. Is that difficult? Hello! <laughs> My goodness, you guys, are you falling asleep? There are many of our men that are good with their hands. Handy. Or if you are not good with your hands, take it to the shop and help them do it. Do you think a person, a woman who is single and parent will appreciate that? Yes. Occasional oil changes? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. How about a lung care? Unless you are Sharon Akimola, that's the only woman I know that cuts grass. I say she needs to have her own long care service. Maybe she, maybe she can extend this service to the people that need it. <laughs> no, but seriously, on a, on a serious note, these are practical, simple things we can start doing. Not just a matter of pray, pray. We're going to pray, 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 fast, 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 pray, pray. And those things are good. We must pray, we must fast. But after you've prayed and fast, what's God saying to you? The evidence that you're praying and fasting is that there must be corresponding action. Otherwise, you're just shouting. If you're praying and fasting, the God will be speaking. And when God speaks, you should move. Amen? Helping kids with the homework. All of these things help alleviate the stress in these homes and families. Amen? Ah, time is flying. Okay. You know what? Let me just call. Is Alamide Lamide here? Where is she? Is Vasya here? Come, come. You guys, come. Come, come to the platform. Most of the other stuff that I have, perhaps when we start, when we start talking, I'll be able to bring them out instead of just giving you too much information. Amen? Uh, how do I... Did you guys hear everything I said so far? Yes, sir. Can, can either of you just take a couple of minutes and just give us your experience of your transition. Uh, both of you, maybe a couple of minutes each. And then for the congregation and for those just watching online, if you just start thinking of your questions, and then as they're speaking, you are welcome to come to the microphones and give your comment or ask your questions, and then we're going to take it from there. Amen? All right, Allah Mede, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, morning. Um, actually, I was married for 15 years altogether before I got divorced. Um, mine was a little bit, can, I'm actually, during the divorce, I was unemployed. When I filed for divorce, I was on the file for divorce. You got what? I was unemployed. Unemployed, okay. So, but, um, but God was faithful. Um, I got an a awesome job that I wasn't even qualified for. Um, for me, um, during the... Mine is a little bit different because I went through all the, like, the anger, the bitterness, the loneliness during my marriage. So when I decided that I'm done, I was done. So I didn't really kind of experience the after, like, the bitterness, the loneliness, anger, you know, when you get in the divorce and when the divorce is finalized. Um, and I was married, but I was a single parent, even in the marriage. So for my transition was easy. So I remember one time my brother was, told me, you know why it's easier for you to kind of, you know, 
you don't really miss that you don't marry because you've been a single parent even when you're married. Wow, Just wow, 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 wow. That's huge. That is huge. I didn't want me to cut you off, but that, that's important. That's a Selah moment. And the reason that's a Selah moment is, I wonder how many more of us are still living at home, married right now, and you are living as a single parent. That is huge. And may God help us to address that issue and to give solution so that we can be totally, completely whole. Thank you so much for bringing that up. So you're saying because you had been living in that condition, even as a married person, now when you became divorced, it's, it's, it's almost like a relief. Unfortunately, I mean, I hate to use that term, but I, I don't know how else to say it. Wow. I never thought about that. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, this guy's crazy. So, um, Like I said, I'm in, you know, I'm not advocating divorce any way, shape, or form. That is like the worst thing ever. Even if you're married and you're living, I mean, the, for the kid, it, it's good to, for them to have both parents. So it was a little bit tough, you know, like, uh, you know, um, for the kids, you know. Um, but um, I was surrounded with um, a lot of, like, their godparents and um, my brothers. I have a lot of support. Because I remember um, when I obtained an attorney, even though my attorney wasn't, a, um, the first attorney wasn't a Christian, the first one asked me, you have to have a good support system. Because it's very, very essential during the, um, during the process of getting divorced and afterwards, because you can't do it by yourself. Although um, I'm a single parent, I had the role as a, a mother and a father in my home, but I cannot take a role of their dad. I'm just, I mean, God didn't call me to be a dad. He called me to be a mother. So, um, so most of the time, I try to kind of engage them in um, godly men that, that can help me and try to fulfill that role. Their dad is still in the, is in the picture, too, so they, they see their daddy often, too. Um, no matter what, I'm not going to take that away. Is there that? It, it, it didn't walk up between both of us. It has nothing to do with the kids. And I always tell them, it's not their fault. It just didn't work out. Um, so. Amen. Thank you. Marcia. Okay, basically my, my situation is I was living in New York. So it was a decision between my ex-husband and I. Eventually, because of the cost of living and the lifestyle in Georgia. So I was the one that gave up everything and came with the two kids at that time to Georgia. So basically I was going to be a stay at home mom. He was going to take care of the whole entire situation here in Georgia. But eventually I got pregnant and I had a third child. I was my last baby. My baby was two months, just over a C-section. And my ex-husband came and he told me about an affair. I tell you so what? about an affair he had going on oh, in New okay. York. So basically, I already discussed with him, not dealing with anything if that came up. I filed for divorce, so that's why, how I became single. So basically, I took care of my kids. I do almost everything here because I don't have any family. Basically, in America, my mom lives in New York, but there's a, that's a different story. So my situation in Georgia itself, it's just me and my three kids. I was fortunate and blessed. Ugo and Neko, my neighbors, right over here. Ugo. Ugo and Neko. Good, good afternoon. How are you? <laughs> Kedu. My my other neighbor, her name was Carla, Mrs. Jenkins. Ms. Jenkins was 80 years old, and I was blessed with those two neighbors. Ugo stepped. There's certain things you will never believe what my neighbor did for me and those kids when I was really going through the situation. Neko is smart. She was slick. She came, I babysit the kids. She would come with a check or money in an envelope. At that time, I needed help. Basically, I was on my own, raising a two months, a three-year-old, and a seven-year-old on my own. While my ex-husband was living in New York, I was here on my own. So I didn't know much people here. I only knew, started knowing my church family, Pastor BK and my house fellowship church. 
Fred Francis, this the Vasola, a couple people here. So basically, I was basically for her, her situation was different. She had her entire family. She knew her, the godparents and so forth. But I basically was raising my three small kids on my own. The task, the responsibility. I actually quit my job just before, um, because my ex-husband wanted me to stay home after I had the baby. And I quit, I had to quit the job, retired. Within a couple of weeks or so, the information came out. Now, I, I suffer with glaucoma. So basically, my situation got worse because eventually when, I'm go when the divorce is going to happen, I'm going to be held without insurance. So glaucoma is a disease with the eyes where I have to use that medication daily so I can go blind, basically. You know, so, so many factors with the divorcing came in because of my predicament, you know? So, you know, a lot of people don't understand. Um, they see you, see us. Okay, we look a certain way, we take, us, take ourselves a certain way, but before that, mentally, a lot of us, I wasn't able to handle it. I, 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 sometimes I thought about committing suicide. Many nights, because of my struggle, Oh, no, it's, it's much better now, but many nights, many days, because my kids used to be sick, I would have to be, the doctors, they were so familiar seeing me, myself, at the ER with the three kids back and forth, so many struggles, so many, but God is good. <clears throat> Amen. So there you have it. That's the story. Any questions, comments, anything? Okay, Pastor, how important is crying in any scenario? Because you just said, Hagar cried and the angel visited her and asked the question, what is telling you? Telling you, I ask that question because um, crying is not just for singles. I know we are talking about singles today, and there are a lot of people who don't cry. Basically, it means uh, they don't present. I mean, they hold it. I, I'm sure that was one of the letters. You know, they don't accept. Uh, they, 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 they are restrained so that. Um, Sometimes help is difficult coming that way. I know you will say, hey, we should see it. We should recognize that. But how is crying important? Uh, if, you, if you understand, you know. Crying of itself is not important. Yes. Crying relative to Hagar was crying to God. Okay. Asking for help. Correct. It's not just sitting and just start crying. Ho, 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 ho. No. Correct. But asking God for help. That's, that's, that's it. And then I think Olamide has something to say to that as well. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> crying. For me, I don't want anybody to pity me except God. So um, crying, I mean, it's okay. But when you're crying, what will crying do for you? You need to take action. You, just, you, need, to, you need to do something. Because crying is not going to do anything. And actually for me, though, um, to share a lot of stuff, I don't personally like to share a lot of stuff. Because if you share, what can they do? Really. So I rather cry to God. God is the only one that understands exactly the way I feel. And he's the only one that can actually help me. So um, not, not, not physically crying before, even before you open your mouth to say anything, you already know what you, you, know, what you need anyway. So, and it's going to provide regardless. So 
the, the only thing we need from a lot of people is just some kind of encouragement. That's it. And exactly like Pastor said, I'm, I'm like a hands-on. I'm hands-on. I'm, my background is engineering. So I'm like a man's man. I, I'll do stuff. I can do certain things. But at times just an encouragement and or just to show that you guys care. That's, that's it. So, but, so in, in what practical ways can we show that we care that you guys will understand and accept? I mean, like the, um, the outchain, I'll take that. <laughs> that <would be> good. <laughs> I can take that, but like, Mrs. Slamni said crying for her, but for me, crying, it relieves a lot of stress, a lot. So for me, I did cry many nights. I still sometimes cry because of the magnitude of the situation and what I have to do to take on as a single parent. My kids, they're in, both in three different schools. So the magnitude of what I have to deal with on a daily basis. So sometimes crying, yes, I cried out, that helps release a lot of stress for me. For some individuals, it might not, but True. for some, it will. For me, that helped. Like she said now, the all change, that would be great because for me, I know nothing about cars, <laughs> nothing at all. Amen. So, you know. Amen. And I think what's interesting here to, to really hear them is, like, is that different people deal with stress in different ways. So there's no formula. There's no one-size-fits-all formula that says this is the way you must deal with stress or grieving or, or in a sad topic. So let, let your, in your personality, let the Holy Spirit use your personality to express whatever needs to be expressed. Uh, that's, that's the bottom line. Yes. Um, first and foremost, uh, I want to uh, honor you guys, honor you ladies, um, because honestly, when we talk about parents being single in church, especially uh, women, it's almost like a taboo in a sense. And so I want to honor you because for the longest that I've been here, seeing you go through your struggles, um, you guys have always been consistent. Um, I can't remember a time that you guys have missed church. Um, you've participated in many ways. Um, you really have represented Christ. Um, in the midst of it all. So I wanted to honor you for that. Um, Thank you. I wanted, the question that I have is finding out what are some of the things that you have done practically in your, you know, in your spiritual disciplines um, that have helped you to get through a lot of the hurdles that you have gotten through. Amen. Um, I'll say for me, um, I know who I am in him. So um, I'm, I'm not trying to be like kind of comfort or whatever, but I, I just know him. And I know he gets my back regardless of what. And uh, I surround myself with positive Christian people that can, you know, at times when I need to yell that they can pull me back and say, oh, I'm day, you're wrong, you know, go this way, whatever, whatever like that. So that, that really, really helped. And um, um, just a personal relationship with him. That's, you, you just got to know him because... No matter what, um, nobody knows exactly what you're going through. Like I said before, he does. And he's the one that can make everything happen. And I know definitely he got my back. Amen. Well, for me, I, I believe, but I'm not strong in my Christian belief like others. But for me, sometimes I read my Bible, I go through stuff, and I pray. And I know we, Salam and I became pretty close because of our situation. And sometimes... For a young person in our situation, I would call on her and address stuff, and she would talk and, and go over stuff. That helps a whole lot in my situation. That's Amen. It. Amen. How fast are arrows? Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, I'm kind of in a similar situation with Olamide, being that I went through everything before the actual, well, not divorce, but separation. You know, a little background, I am from Nigeria, of course. I live in Nigeria. So, you know, in Nigeria, we're married to the family. So the separation is a, really, a bit difficult. So I've been separated for three years. But, you know, my, our family is a best of friends. So we're not, you know, I was almost at the point of being granted a divorce when my father-in-law called me. And the emotional blackmail was too much for me. So I withdrew the divorce. <laughs> but anyways, I, I stand to encourage other people parenting um, alone. Um, first of all, I learned that 
it's amazing where God will take you to. It's amazing how God comes to that need you think you cannot get through. So um, for me, God has been extremely faithful financially, but I see myself struggle with things like making decisions for my children, like when we're getting ready to go to college. It was a lot of burden for me to decide alone, knowing that you're trying to make a lifetime decision for this person. There is really nobody to, you know, go to. So for me, it's more like an emotional thing. I don't want to go through things alone. And then when it comes to crying, I think that the crying sometimes, especially for me, is very relevant because that way I cry myself and I tell myself, like, it's you against the world, so you have to get up and do yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So I think the crying is good. It just it kind of helps me as well. <laughs> I, I think also the church has a problem. In Lagos, I had to change church a bit. I finally found a church elevation. And I found that why I fell in love with elevation is because they weren't judgmental. So they had programs that would actually deal with single parents. Because it, it's real. It, maybe it wasn't like this before. And I went to a program where Pastor Godman actually discussed the concept of it being more rampant now. So my former church, which I loved so much, we would pray, but, you know, I kept hearing them judge me. I kept hearing them sound like I had done something wrong. And it wasn't anything I did wrong. I think I did my best as a wife and as a mother, but it wasn't anything I could control. So sometimes the church, the church doesn't do right by, you know, failed marriages, especially in Nigeria. We're still a little bit too judgmental. And, you know, more like just talking about the support system. I'm sorry I'm talking too long. But anyways, um, the support system is still being judgmental. Even my family, my sisters are like my best friends. I can't say love because my daughter and my niece are here with me. My sisters are like my <laughs> best friends, but, you know, they don't judge me, but they would rather I stay in the marriage. But I keep saying, you weren't there with me. Now, and again, I encourage single mothers. I don't contend with my husband on any grounds. I don't, I, I encourage my children to be close to him. I don't think he's a bad father. I don't think he's a bad man. I just think, I always say it's irreconcilable differences. It happened and it happened. I'm not trying to judge him and say he was wrong. But I encourage the relationship between him and his children. I think it's good for them and I think it's the right thing. Amen. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I'll take the opportunity to thank you, Pastor Guy. Uh, thank you so many families in this congregation who have been very, very supportive since 2012. I don't know the word is not there. I just thank God for the bread, for his sufficient bread. Thank you, Ms. Megan and uh, Ms. Ola. God is faithful. Amen. And I've borne so much on this scripture that says, Lord, temptation has taken me. It says, when you're tempted, God will make a way. Mm. God has made a way in so many ways through so many people. And I'm so thankful for my brethren in this church. I can only say the heart of God is in this church. I can't go through every single one of the families that have been so very supportive. But I thank God. I thank God. I'm so sorry. That's all right. You're home, Rose. Anyway, 
my my question, I guess, was on, you know, balancing um, <laughs> balancing life, <coughs> providing affection to the children and discipline them. And supporting them in any way I can, knowing that I can't. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. <laughs> the gist of our question is. How does she balancing affection for the kids with discipline and so forth and so on? Let me let those that are in it tell us how they've done so. And if there's anything for me to add, I will. For me, discipline, I'm straight. I'm Caribbean, and I know with my culture, yes, I'm not the male in my home, but I'm the female. And basically for me, my kids have to understand the rules the regulations, especially pertaining school, the school situation. Like from the education, my kids know 1B is allowed for school. Anything pertaining to school, anything pertaining rude. If my kids are rude, I, I don't spare the rod. I give my little one, the last little one, he gets his ears ring, he, he would get a spanking. The oldest now with, um, I think it was much more stricter with him. But with, um, I lay, um, I don't know, like, like for me, I lay the rules down and expect them to obey, right? If it's not, regu I regulate how, um, and to, how to, I regulate the, um, the balance of um, the responsibilities and what, ex what my expectation of respect. Um, for me, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm more like, uh, like do it this way, but I encourage, actually my kids have another outlet. So, um, they, they have a, another parents, a children that they regard them as a good parents. I'm like the main one that they can, you know, they can go to and, um, you know, they can talk, you know, to that situation, but the house, so I'll let them know I love them and they do. But I'm the parents, they're the child, they're the child. child. So um, it's, I mean, it, it has to be balanced, definitely. But, um, you know, and they know regardless of what, you want the best for them. And, but the, 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 they, they should have another outlet, you know, another proper parents for them to reach out to. Okay, good. What, what I'd like to add to their contribution is, it may be good to sit down with your children and do what I can call it, social covenant what the social covenant entails is certain values and things and expectations that all of you have of one another in this house we will study in this house we'll be honest in this house whatever it is that you think needs to bring you guys all together you guys have a conversation about them and all of you agree on whatever those things are and then all of you agree when I failed to meet this expectation. What do the next steps be? Social covenant. That social covenant will cover everything from the expectations and when the expectations are not met, what are the next steps? So that once the expectation is not met, we're not scrambling to say, what are we going to do? We already agreed at the beginning that this way we're going to approach it. So a social covenant will help. But at the same time, like Olamide and uh, Vasia says, we must really really work hard in loving these children love is not just what you speak it's also action it's an action actionable word so because we're trying to help them uh, uh cope with the with the change that's come upon them for, of which they had nothing to do with it and uh especially when there's the other parent that's still involved these kids must deal with different a rule in your house here and a rule in that house there uh, so there are so many dynamics that we can never cover in any one session. Uh, and that's where the having a relationship with God is very, very important. 
and happy, having God uh, continue to uh, teach and guide us on what we need to do. Amen? Ma'am. And then. Sorry, I had to breach uh, protocol. I really thank you, Pastor Banky, because you've been a father to one of my kids. And Pastor Tosin, too, has been a mother to one of my kids. I happen to have been a single parent for a pretty long time. I've got married again, and I lost my husband. It's been hard, but I bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. Good yes. morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I am Zemar. Uh, Some of y'all may know me. Good morning. I just want to say um, I really do appreciate y'all because I had a single mother until I was 16 years old. Thank you. I had a single mother until I was 16 years old. Um, she had five of us for a while. She didn't get married until October 29th. That was like two years ago. It's been a blessed two years, but those years of my 16-year-old life, I'm 18 now. I just turned 18 this past Wednesday. <laughs> I thank God for it. <laughs> but my mom had five of us. It was all five of us. You know, having three, having two, having one as a single parent. I know it's really hard, but my mom managed to do it, and I have three sisters that already graduated before she was married, um, and she was single while it happened. I just think women are just amazing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Hi, moms. <laughs> I really appreciate all the moms out here. If I don't know you, if I do know you, I think all of y'all moms out here, like, I really do, like, I want to give y'all a round of applause for that, like. I really do, like, I, I don't know, but. <laughs> I just want to wish the best of luck to the both of you for the rest of your lives. Um, whatever happens, God bless you, and God bless your kids. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. All right, Miss Megan. Oh, wow. Miss Megan. <laughs> First and foremost, I want to encourage. This is encouragement. I've been in you guys' situation. I'm way older than you guys. You guys know my one child and what she has accomplished. And it's just by the grace of God. He knows your situation. He's there each and every day for you. You just got to hold on, hold on. Hold on, be steadfast. Amen. All right, uh, looks like we are done. You, you want to say something? Okay. My question is, is it a challenge for those of you that have boys to raise boys uh, without the influence of the father. Sometimes the father is there, but sometimes the father isn't there. Um, I just know that, well, that's my question, but I just know that it can be very challenging because we are females, and it's sometimes we don't understand the male hormone, and our boys are growing up from 13 on up to teenage. So um, my question is, is it challenging for you? Are you willing to receive help from a godly male from the church to influence the boys to become men? Okay, um, actually for me, uh, I don't want to have a challenge. I, I, I'm more kind of time with 50 compared to Angela right now. Um, but, you know, Angela is 13 and kind of like the, the cool guy among um, you know, my kids right now. Um, I mean, definitely, um, it's not a challenge for me right now, but it's a concern. 
for me, like, um, how, how will I be to able to instill, like, male's value in him? Because I'm the mother. But thank God he has um, his godparents that is very, very involved, and his uncles. And, I mean, I, I, I really, you know, entertain any godly male in his life because I think it's going to be a positive thing. Because I know I cannot do certain things a man can instill with them. But for right now, I don't tell anybody, just a concern for me. Amen. For me, Mike, I, I do have a concern because I, I don't want to uh, speak badly of anyone, but their dad is not really in their life in the way I expect him to be that dad. So for Marcus, who's 16, and Noah, who's nine, yes. If I can get any kind of assistance godly from any godly individual male here, I would really, really appreciate it because for me, my 16-year-old, I know he, he went through that phase and that struggle of this divorce, of the, separate, the divorce, the separation, everything. And it was challenging, very to this day, still very challenging for me to deal with him because I can see his behavior. I can see things that have impacted the whole situation in our lives, and I fight every t every day. Are you okay? Do you want to talk? Is something bothering you? Do you want? Is there anything I can help you with? Talk to me. I'm always there because that's all I can do. And I see the relationship he has with his dad. Honestly, I, I don't care if anyone is offended. It's not good. And I know my son needs that at this age. If anyone, because. Basically, I think he needs therapy, honestly, but I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do here. He needs help. Amen. God is the help of the helpless. And so that's why we need to cry unto God, and God gives us the wisdom, and that's why we brought this to the whole body, so the body understands the pain, the frustrations, and the need so that the body can be motivated to know how they best can serve you and be a blessing to you guys. And again, we want to commend you. We thank God for you. And for the rest of those that are parenting alone, we salute you. We thank God for you. And remember, God has not forgotten you. God has not forsaken you. It is not over for you. God has a plan and an expected end for you. And we are trusting God that God will bring you to that place where you will be satisfied and fulfilled and thriving in Amen. Jesus' name. Now, I did not cover everything that's in my notes. If you want more information about this subject, if you ask Revelation, we can send it to you by email, and so you can have it. But I think we have enough to know where we need to get started. And uh, I want to acknowledge my friend that's here this morning, my friend John. My friend John, will you stand, please? My yes. 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 I'm acknowledging him because he falls into one of those very unusual categories of parenting alone, at least for this season. But God is helping him, and God is also establishing him, and all things shall be well in Jesus' name. Praise God. You may be said that. And so, my final word will be, for those of you that have received ministry from God, Rose Motebi, you said about how God has been faithful, for all of you that God has been faithful to, what are you going to do with that faithfulness? That's why I want to close this morning. What are we going to do with the faithfulness that we receive from God? The Bible says, freely we have received, freely we should give. Now, I'm not talking money. I'm not talking money. I'm saying to us, we need to start seriously thinking of how we can be a minister at every level. And by that I'm saying, for those of us that have received ministry and faithfulness from God, maybe you need to start prayerfully thinking, God, how can I begin something, however small, to start touching other households, other that are parenting alone? How can I begin to transfer what I've gotten to encourage them, to be a blessing to them, to minister to them? That's how ministry starts. The comfort that we've received from God, from the Holy Spirit, God wants us to transfer that comfort to others who have not received it. Let's pray. Father, 
Thank you so much for giving us this platform to speak about families who are parenting alone. We know your heart. We know your desire to see the needs of the fatherless and the widows and all those who are struggling in their households or even who are those who are even thriving for that matter. But we see your heart that your heart goes out to touch every family situation so that all their needs are met beyond and above that which they can think or ask according to the power of God that's our work in us. And so Lord Jesus, I thank you for a release of another dose of your love to us in this congregation. That we embrace your love in such a way that it's not just something we embrace and talk about, but it's something we embrace, talk about, and do something with. That God this morning will be mobilized into action. How can we be our brother's keeper? How can we be our sister's keeper? How can we be more sensitive to the needs of those around us? Help us to lift up our eyes away from ourselves and to see your plan and to see your purpose and to see what you're doing in the lives of others. Help us to become instruments in your hands to meet the needs in other people's lives. This is what counts. Not how long we live for, but how many lives we touch while we're here. And so, Father God, help us this morning. Help us not to be just hearers of the word, but God, help us to become doers of your word. I pray for every parent in a low family that they'll find you faithful. That they'll find you, God, to be a God who is always ready to be helpers. I thank you, Father God, that they will find you to be indeed a God that is ever present. When a father or a mother may not be there, but you are always there. He said, you will never leave them alone, that you will never forsake them. And so, Father, we thank you for the reality of your presence in their lives. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that every need they have, physically, spiritually, emotionally, all those needs are met in and through you by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And God, that they will not be in a hurry to make another mistake. God, that you are the one that meets the need for their significance. You meet the need for their security. You meet the need, Lord God, for them to feel loved. You are the one that meet all those needs. And that they will not be looking to have those needs met in places and people other and outside of who you are. Thank you, Father God. We bless you. And we bless them. And we thank you for their children. That indeed, they will be a great nation. They will excel. They will make progress. They will succeed. They will lack no good thing because you're a good father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness. We bless you and we praise you. We magnify you now, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.